Welcome back to Elder Sign, a weird fiction podcast by Clay Temple Media. I'm Brandon Buddha. And I'm Glenn McDorman. This episode, we are covering the story Purity by Thomas Ligotti. It's our, our second Ligotti story here on Elder Sign. This story can be found in the 2006 collection, Teatro Grotesco. Uh, I haven't read any other stories in this collection yet, and Purity is the first one. And if this first story is any indication, this is a perfect like fall Halloween collection to read. And uh, that's my plan for this fall. Yeah, I'm really excited that we now have copies of this collection. Uh, this was a story that was nominated by one of our Patreon supporters, and it also won our most recent Patreon vote uh, to select this batch of stories. This is the, the first of four here. And there were some fun and surprising results to that vote. So tied with this story, tied with Purity, was another Clark Ashton Smith story. And this is the classic, The Door to Saturn, which I haven't read since high school. It's been decades since I've read that. So I'm super excited to, to get to that one again. And we're also going to do our second Edgar Allan Poe story. And this will be The Sphinx, which I'm also very excited about. But this one, for reasons that I will keep secret until we actually do that episode. And then finally, we're going to cover From the Tideless Sea, Part 1 by William Hope Hodgson. Uh, this was a another one that was nominated by one of our patrons. And so this is really a, a nice mix of stories that I've read before and stories that I haven't. And I really am looking forward to this entire batch to, to doing episodes on, on each of these stories. And of course, we want to say thanks to all of our supporters. I have so much fun with these votes and I hope you guys do too. Yeah, I was really excited by these results. And we're going to be doing the runner up on Patreon. So if you're been enjoying our free episodes of Elder Sign and you want to listen to more, consider supporting us on Patreon. You'll also be able to vote for the stories that we select. Uh, that story is Russell Kirk's Ex Tenebris. And Russell Kirk has come up for us in the Gene Wolfe Literary Podcast and on the forum. So I'm really excited to read this story. Yes, I am too. I actually had never heard of Russell Kirk until he came up on, on the forum. And he came up in a really big, important way. So I'm excited to to cover this story. Also, you know, as a medievalist, if a story's got a Latin title, I'm I'm like 50% already super excited about it just on the basis of that alone. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. So let's get to the story at hand, which is Purity by Thomas Ligotti. This is a great story. And at first glance, it might just feel like a, a series of strange events that don't really hang together well. So we, we really have a lot of work to do to pull out the meat and the plot and, and the story behind the story. And I think our work on Gene Wolfe has trained us well to do that. But I really did love this story. So Glenn, let's just get right to it. We were living in a rented house, neither the first nor the last of a long succession of such places that the family inhabited throughout my childhood years. It was shortly after we had moved into this particular house that my father preached to us his philosophy of rented living. He explained that it was not possible to live in any other way, and that attempting to do so was the worst form of delusion. Those are the opening lines of Purity, a first-person narrative of a childhood encounter with the weird. It's a classic narrative technique of the genre, but also really one of my favorite narrative techniques of the genre. And I know that we're only three lines into this story, but I will say right now that I love the narrative voice that Ligotti adopts for this piece. Uh, besides being genuinely creepy, it's simply a pleasure to read from a wordsmithing standpoint. I think we're going to just really enjoy the, the, the act of reading this story. Yeah, I have some prose examples coming up that demonstrate uh, both the, the voice of the character, but also Ligotti's mastery of this, the weird style. And we're going to see as we spend more time with this narrator just how sort of disaffected he is by a lot that's going on in the world around him. And uh, that's a big part of this concept of purity that's being explored in the story. Right. Well, now that I have already derailed us, as I am often want to do, let, let's actually hear about this philosophy of rented living, which is kind of the hook here in this opening. The narrator's father goes on to explain that nothing really belongs to us, that, that everything in the world is something that is rented out, e even if it's something that we think that we own, right? If it's something we have a, a title or a deed for, it doesn't matter. We still really just rent it. And this is true of material objects such as sofas, but it is also true of our ideas, which we are also just renting from previous generations and from other people. Every thought we have is a thought that many someone else's have also had. And the father finishes with a really great line, so I'll, I'll just read this. He says, We live in a world where every surface, every opinion or passion, everything altogether is tainted by the bodies and minds of strangers. And then he says that we're all covered with cooties, which I haven't said the word cootie out loud in decades, so that's awesome. And these are both physical and intellectual cooties, cooties that have been crawling all over other people as well. 
this concept of intellectual cooties is like is really is really close to Richard Dawkins' uh, kind of invention or popularization of the idea of the the meme. And so there's there's a part of this story that's about the contamination of ideas and the way the father presents the concept of intellectual cooties and like renting is for me a great way to introduce the gothic element that is really backgrounded in this story and one thing we'll talk about in the discussion is how much Ligotti is leaning on and subverting gothic tropes uh, for the use of this story this father is the type of character we see in gothic fiction a lot. He, he feels to me like an aristocrat who has lost his standing in the world and maybe his possessions and is now motivated entirely by some evil impulse in order to punish those who took it away from him or at least live in spite of those people. But as we'll see, he's also a mad scientist, which is a classic trope of weird fiction. And we're going to continue to see with this theme of purity that the father has turned purity into a vice. And I think those of us who are familiar with 20th century history will not see this as being an impossibility. And so Ligotti is playing with some of those ideas as well. Yeah, as you say, the father is a, a mad scientist character here, and, and that's going to be a big part of the weird element of this story, which we're going to get introduced to us right now, right? The the weird element, the the thing that is actually going to be the, the plot of this story. So the, the narrator, it turns out, also lives in an unconventional family. I guess we've seen that already, uh, and that's going to be the important feature here. But at the start, it seems that it's really the house they are currently renting and the, the neighborhood it's in that that matters the most. The narrator describes this in another great bit of writing. He says, it was an especially cootie-ridden residence in a bad neighborhood that bordered on an even worse neighborhood. The place was also slightly haunted, which was more or less the norm for the habitations my father chose to rent. And I do love this pair of sentences, but I also really admire Ligotti's storytelling technique here because he throws out this word haunted and then ignores it as he focuses on something else. It's a, it's a big tease that makes us eager to turn the page. This is just masterful. And the something else that Ligotti focuses on is the narrator's family. They move around a lot, several times a year, in fact. And they do this because the father is doing some kind of research that requires this kind of house, a house that is slightly haunted. And exactly what this research is is not clear at this point. But he does this work in the basement. And when he really gets going, he basically just lives down in the basement for weeks at a time with everyone else forbidden from disturbing him. He does, though, sometimes need members of the family to participate in his experiments. And here we learn that the rest of the family is a mom and a sister. And, and by the way, the narrator is a boy, and we're going to learn that his name is Daniel in a few pages, so we might as well call him Daniel now. So Daniel's mother and sister frequently go off on trips together, but Daniel has no idea what these trips are for, and it's not clear that Dad does either, because he calls these trips unknown sabbaticals. And these trips, and also his father's work, leave Daniel on his own a lot. And that's the situation that we find ourselves in one evening in late autumn when our story proper is going to take place. And the inciting incident here is the ringing of the doorbell, something that Daniel had never heard before in any of their houses. Daniel is just about to go down to the ground floor to answer the door when his father, who's come up from the basement for the first time in quite a while, beats him to it. At the door is a young man from Citizens for Faith, which is a, a totally made-up organization, but which is exactly what it sounds like it is. And this young man wants to preach to the people in this house and maybe get a donation for his church. And the father agrees to hear him out, but only if he'll agree to let him challenge the implicit assumptions of the name Citizens for Faith. He, he wants to challenge the core worldview that's embedded in these terms. And, and the first of these principles is the idea of nations, countries, the whole hullabaloo of motherlands and fatherlands. And of course, we've talked about the invention of ethnicity and nationalism on this show back when we did the first King in Yellow story, The Repairer of Reputations. And by the way, the, the next story in that collection has been on the ballot, but it just keeps missing the cutoff by like two or three votes each time. I'm, I'm sure we'll get there. And the, the second of these principles is deities. The father goes on to say that neither of these principles has anything real about them. They are merely impurities poisoning this young man's head. And these two impurities, plus one more impurity that is not named now, but will be important at the end of the story, uh, all three of these impurities must be eliminated before our species can begin an approach to a pure conception of existence. And 
again, this is a really interesting idea. I'm sure we're going to talk about this in the discussion. Yeah, there's an awful lot going on in this section. For one thing, you know, while the father is trying to win over this uh, religious solicitor at the door, he does a number of things. But one thing he says is try to use a common language. He says, it's almost as if a fortuitous element of intervention brought you to the house. If I were to believe something so preposterous, I highlight this line because I think it says a number of things about the father. One, it's not clear to me. And and a big question at the end of the story will be if the father has been able to rid himself of these impurities that are obstacles to the pure conception of the world. But also, the introduction of this character and the way the father tries to win him over makes it really unclear to me how the father gets any of his test subjects or how many test subjects he's had besides the family. And if the only people who he works on are those who are unlucky enough to wander into the house, like a Jehovah's Witness type of figure. I also want to point out uh, before moving on here that this idea of nationality uh, being a problem has already kind of come up in the story with with Daniel's disgust and disdain of his mother's smoking European cigarettes in the house, which foul up the air. And we're going to see Daniel in much worse environments than this. But this European cigarette is something that he has absolutely no taste for, and it makes him sick. And so we're beginning to see maybe what types of experiments have really been run on Daniel. But to return to the father here, we also get a sense of what his goal of purity is. You know, he he wants to dispel people of their belief in nations and countries and deities or religious superstitions or superstitions of any kind, spiritual beliefs. And As you said, Glenn, and as we've been talking about, getting rid of those ideas along with that mysterious third will provide a pure conception of the world. But this is all just a cover for the fact that there's no positive definition of purity. It's a purely negative concept. And the father then seems to be obsessed with things that defile his sense of what being in the world ought to be like. And so he's obsessed with getting rid of those things, but he has no thesis on what living in a positive world would be like. Right. He's trying to improve the world by removing something from it rather than adding something to it. And these are very different worldviews, very different approaches to to improving the society that you live in. And and I'm looking forward to talking about that in the, in the discussion. And as you've alluded to already, Brandon, he's not a good guy, right? So here's the deal. The the father says that he'll donate a big wad of cash to Citizens for Faith if this young man will give him a chance to take those heinous principles and clean them out of his head. And this phrasing is a little different than what he said at first, which was simply challenge his notions. And this phrasing is going to turn out to be important. And to do this, the, the father wants the young man to join him in the basement This is ominous. It's a bad idea in any situation, but especially so since we've already gleaned that there is a mad scientist lab down there, right? But we're actually not going to find out any more about this for quite a while. This is another thing that Ligotti is about to, to take away from this story. It's another tease. Okay, so the the father and this extremely naive young man descend into the basement, leaving Daniel to his own devices for the evening. And now we're going to follow his adventure for most of the, the rest of this story. And what Daniel is going to do is go visit a friend of his who lives nearby. One thing I want to point out before we get to Daniel's friend here is that during the conversation between the father and the citizens for faith guy, the guy in the suit maybe is the best way to refer to him, the man in the suit says that he doesn't believe that faith is just something that's in his own head. And the father agrees and says, well, yeah, it's in everybody's head or it's everywhere. And they they talk about that a little bit. But the father also says that something like that is in this house. And it's clear that he's talking about the son, some belief in the superstitious. And we've already mentioned that the house was haunted and that many houses are haunted that they live in. And I'll be honest, on on a first read through of this story, I almost got upset that this was just going to be a story narrated by a ghost. But as we've already pointed out, Ligotti's narrative technique is to tease these ideas and then change direction. So you're always off balance. And he brings up two or three more major mysteries to this story before we see any have a resolution, if any of them really do. But I just want to assure our readers, it's not my belief that this is 
a story narrated by Daniel, who was haunting the house. Right. And in any event, Daniel is about to leave the house. So, you know, maybe there are ghosts that can do that, but that's not our standard understanding of, of what a ghost is. And so Daniel is about to go out into this neighborhood. And I have to say, I really love Ligotti's description of the environs. So I am just going to read this. This is what Daniel says. To be precise, my friend did not live in the bad neighborhood where my family had rented a house, but in the worse neighborhood nearby. It was only a few streets away, but this was the difference between a neighborhood where some of the houses had bars across their doors and windows, and one in which there was nothing left to protect, or to save, or to care about in any way. It was another world altogether, a twisted paradise of danger and derangement, of crumbling houses packed extremely close together, of burned-out houses leaning toward utter extinction, of houses with black openings where once there had been doors and windows— and of empty fields over which shone a moon that was somehow different from the one seen elsewhere on this earth. And there are a number of things I love about this passage. I mean, for one, it's just some vivid and well-cadenced wordsmithing. But two, it is a perfect description of my own experience of Philadelphia, where in 10 minutes I can walk from my gentrifying neighborhood through barred doors and windows and onward to crumbling houses in really just a matter of about 10 or 15 minutes. And so this is really evocative and real to me. But I also love that he finishes this description by invoking an element of the fantastical, a moon that is somehow different from that scene elsewhere, right? It's almost like we're in a sort of weird version of Lothlorien here. And, and bringing weird fiction out of the wilderness, out of you know, Antarctica, out of the, the countryside of England's both old and new, and into the, the cities and the suburbs of America is a, a fantastic move. It's a great move. And it's one we saw Ligotti doing in The Frolic as well. Yeah, I love this passage. If you weren't going to read it, I was. Uh, my note was, if Glenn doesn't read this, I'm going to read it. Because it is such a good example of weird fiction prose that is both ethereal but fits perfectly in the imagination of the narrator. And Ligotti goes on in the next paragraph to evoke more haunted house imagery. Uh, and so this story is just so deeply caught up, again, in these sort of gothic, haunted, crumbling mansions that, as you pointed out, are, take place in the suburbs or in the inner city. And I think it's a marvelous innovation of the form to do that. Absolutely, right? This is the type of description that we get of of a, a 19th century mansion or, a, you know, a mansion in a 19th century story that probably is actually uh, an 18th century, you know, large house, aristocratic house, either in America or in the, the UK. But here, Ligotti is applying that same type of description to what probably was a working class neighborhood uh, in the early and sort of middle parts of the 20th century. But then after the collapse of the, the steel industry and the cascading effect, of that has has crumbled into to this right so he's 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 bringing the gothic not just into the american city but actually he's he's removing it from its sort of aristocratic environs and 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 giving it to the the working class as well i'm not sure it's really a gift right but applying it maybe is the verb i'm looking for there all right so you can tell i think that i'm really loving this story and it means i keep digressing to talk about how much i love it but i will uh, get back now to my duties of talking about what actually happens in the story so let's go meet daniel's friend Daniel's friend is not, as I think we would expect, a kid who lives in this neighborhood, but is in fact an adult. It is uh, a black woman who may be middle-aged or perhaps even a little bit older. Uh, Ligotti just writes that she's of indefinite age. And we get some backstory about how Daniel actually met this woman, and we're going to get a description that made me gasp and groan such that my wife came into the room to make sure I was all right. It's the <laughs> most horrifying thing I've ever read is about to happen here. So Daniel is simply out walking one night when he goes by one of these crumbling houses that has uh, sheets up over the, the empty window holes. And as he passes by, this woman calls to him to, to go get her some salami sticks from the nearby store. And... Daniel's accommodating, and when he returns with them, he goes inside the house to see this woman lying on a couch watching uh, a battery-operated TV. And this is where we're going to get the most disturbing thing that I have ever read, because she is also dunking an uncooked hot dog into a jar of mayonnaise and eating it. And I almost could not go on from this point. I mean, it just grossed me out way more than any <laughs> gory serial killer scene I've ever read. I mean, just disgusting. It's so gnarly, man. I I just was disgusted by this too. And 
this is like only the third most disgusting thing and distressing thing he encounters in the, in this house, but it was the one that was most off putting to me as a reader as well. This uh, image of the no electrical cord on the TV, I mean, he, Daniel imagines it's battery operated, but there's no real proof of that. And it called immediately to mind to me Kubrick's The Shining, which famously has the, the scene of uh, Danny Torrance sitting in front of the TV and watching it, you know, and there's no outlet for the cord. You have no idea how it's operating. And so it's this type of like weird and haunting imagery that that Ligotti is really pulling on for this story. And I love it. Right. We see how Daniel all throughout the story is actually trying to rationalize what he sees, right? He's, he's gathering evidence about the world, mostly visual, but through, through his, his senses, and then is trying to rationalize how those things can all add up, which makes sense with what we've heard his father say already, right? That he's grown up in this household with maybe a hyper rational mad scientist who likes to experiment on people in the, in the basement. But it's not clear that they're actually are any rational explanations for the things that Daniel has seen. And it may be that this TV is just operating on some kind of psychic principle. We also never find out what she's actually watching on the TV. Right. And they spend a lot of time watching TV and never runs out of batteries, but she never leaves the, the house she's squatting in. It's a very weird environment and it's only going to get weirder. Well, that may actually be what she's using the salami sticks for, right? She's not eating them because she's got enough hot dogs and mayonnaise, but the salami sticks are what's powering the TV. <laughs> I've heard of that. <laughs> All right, let, let's, uh, let's get back to it here. So Daniel marvels that he's actually inside one of these crumbling houses, and it feels to him like it's a place cut off from reality itself. And that appeals to him. He's attracted to this, and he wants to stay. Being a kid, though, he does the only thing he can think of that will let him stay in the house a little bit longer, and that is to ask to use the bathroom. And the woman gives him a flashlight, because there's no electricity here and therefore no lights, and tells him not to fall in. Uh, I guess that's solid advice in many circumstances, but here specifically, it's because there is not any toilet. There's just a hole in the floor where the toilet has collapsed into the basement. And that's really it for this visit. But Daniel does ask her if he can return sometime. And the, the woman, and her name is, is Candy. We're going to uh, learn in just a bit. Uh, Candy agrees. Uh, and I'll say also that there are some dudes here who just kind of hang around in the living room sometimes as well. But Daniel doesn't interact with them in this scene very much. Uh, and they're not going to really matter uh, until later. Okay, so Daniel gives us some sense of what those future visits were like before he gets into the real plot of the matter. And for the most part, they just watch TV together, as you said, Brandon, because their conversations usually stalled out due to inhabiting completely different mental worlds. For example, Candy has trouble comprehending that Daniel's mother smokes cigarettes from Europe, right? Like Europe is just a concept that is kind of inconceivable to her. While Daniel has trouble understanding when Candy nonchalantly, I mean, just really without any emotion, just says, you know, I had a little boy that was about your age. He got killed. And on the topic of kids getting killed, Daniel learns a little bit after this visit that there have actually been a number of child murders in this neighborhood. And this is something that he learns from his mother, who warns him about visiting Candy. And she describes this as some dangerous pervert cutting kids' throats. And there's an interesting note here that she told Daniel this with outrageous insincerity. What that actually means is unclear at this moment, but it's going to come back. This is another moment where Ligotti's style for the story really shines. He's introducing another mysterious element, maybe setting up some involvement with the main characters of the family. You know, is the father a child catcher? Is this related to the experiments in the basement somehow? Or is there a real murderer? Uh, we don't know if what the mother says is true, but he dismisses the notion instantly by everybody telling Daniel that this all happened before his family moved to the neighborhood. So you're, as a reader, just your mind is swirling as you're trying to play with the possibilities uh, and the mysteries that Ligotti raises only to have them dismissed, but you're still left with the discomfort of these ideas just being so close to each other. I think it's just, it's a style of writing that's really impressed me uh, uh, more so than I, than I think I expected it to. One thing Ligotti also does is put Daniel's mother in contrast with Candy and the way Candy lives. We know that Daniel finds his mother's European cigarettes putrid and foul, literally these words that are about impurity and uncleanliness. 
but he's fine with the way Candy lives, with looking down the toilet hole and seeing broken glass covered with human waste and whatever else is down there. And he imagines about this basement a lot. And nothing about Candy's environment troubles him the way it would a normal person. It's it's literally impure. But the th- only thing that really makes him feel violated is his mother's European cigarettes. It's very bizarre. And the way Ligotti puts these into contrast is so subtle and brilliant. I absolutely love it. And learning that there's a child murderer in this neighborhood that Daniel likes to go hang out in, it does not deter him from going there anymore. And in fact, quite the opposite. It it fascinates him. It makes his visits more I- I- exciting. It it attracts him. And we see this time and again with Daniel, that he's attracted to these weird things and these things that most of us would regard as as dangerous, things where we would we'd say, nope, I'm, I'm getting out of this situation. But even though it doesn't deter Daniel, his father has actually now given him, and and also his sister, a a weapon that his father has devised. And it looks like a fountain pen, but it is not. Uh, And you can bet that this will come back. It is Chekhov's not really a fountain pen. So on the night in question, Daniel has something else that he's gotten from his father, and he wants to show this to Candy. And this is where we're going to get back to the the haunted house part of this and, and learn a little bit and learn a little more about what father is up to in the basement When they first moved into this house, Daniel helped his father with the first phase of his experiments. And the reason Daniel helped is that he was the one who was sensitive to the haunted nature of this house's attic, where Daniel would would go into and then get this sense that some former occupant had once hanged himself from the beams. But Daniel's father believes that there's not actually anything haunted about the house, but that what's going on is all inside Daniel's head. And we get a fantastic mad scientist speech about this that is just a a great homage to Lovecraft's story from beyond. I'm just going to read this because it's awesome. There is nothing in the attic. It's only the way that your head is interacting with the space of that attic. There are certain fields of forces that are everywhere. And these forces, for reasons unknown to me as yet, are potentiated in some places more than others. Do you understand? The attic is not haunting your head. Your head is haunting the attic. Some heads are more haunted than others, whether they are haunted by ghosts or by gods or by creatures from outer space. These are not real things. Nonetheless, they are indicative of real forces, animating and even creative forces, which your head only conceives to be some kind of spook or who knows what. You are going to help me prove this by allowing me to use my apparatus in the basement to siphon from your head that thing which you believe is haunting the attic. This siphoning will take place in a very tiny part of your head. Because if I siphoned your whole head, well, well, never mind about that. Believe me, you won't feel a thing. And that's what the father does. He, he siphons some fluid out of his son's head. And, he, and Daniel now has that fluid in a jar. And, and that's what he's bringing to show candy is his brain fluid. And after this siphoning, Daniel doesn't sense the haunting in the attic anymore, except that is when he has the jar with him, when it's touching him. And indeed, when he has the jar with him, when he hugs it close to him, he actually feels the haunted presence more intensely than he did before. Right. I just want to emphasize here, as you did point out, that this phase one of the experiment took place before the narration of the story begins. This takes place before Daniel meets meets Candy, uh, but he just hasn't been allowed to carry the jar with him. His father has given it to him only recently. I love that speech as well. I love this idea that your head is haunting the attic and and the real incongruity and the cognitive dissonance in the father's thought about saying, well, the things that you think are out there aren't out there but it indicates that there is something out there (laughs) just as mysterious that I don't want to give a name to the fields of forces or or whatever it is. It's, it's really fascinating. And the fact that this experiment kind of works is also really interesting. But if the father is just siphoning brain fluid and Daniel doesn't feel the haunting anymore, but he's still left with his, the images of the hanged man in the attic. It, it kind of doesn't follow that he, that the haunting is done, only that he just doesn't feel like there's a presence there. But he's still haunted, in, in another sense of the word, by the images that his imagination conjured that made him feel that presence in the first place. It's very strange, and it, it really helps to explain 
Daniel's total nonchalance and disaffected nature and odd approach to the world where he is out trying to make discoveries, as you say, but he's only out to get his curiosity sated, not to make any judgments or moral claims about right or wrong. It's a very, very bizarre approach that the, that, that, that our narrator is taking to exploring the world. We, and we are going to see some more of the father's experiments, but we're not actually going to get any more explanation about them, right? So there's no, there's no real scientific explanation for what the father is actually up to. But I guess we can imagine that there's some gland that we have in all of us that makes us, or some of us anyway, more sensitive to supernatural phenomena or more prone to that. And he's siphoning off the, I don't know, the, the hormone or, or something like that, that that gland secretes, but we don't get any actual like sort of technical scientific explanation for that. You know, he's just a, just a man with some tubes that suck stuff out of your head. I mean, it's like, like the pit of despair in the princess bride, right? It's, it's kind of a, a laughable kind of pulpy sort of mad scientist thing here. And we're going to see some more of that when we get to the end of the story. But for now, we are going to go back to Daniel going to, to Candy's house with this jar of his own brain fluid. And when Daniel gives this jar to, to Candy, she also has a haunting experience with it, but it is not the same as Daniel. She doesn't sense the, the suicide in the attic. Rather, Candy just kind of gets a little bit distant and says, Oh my God, I knew it. I knew that he wasn't gone for me. I knew that I wasn't alone. And I think it, it's clear from the, the context, right, that she's feeling the presence of her dead son when she touches this jar of this brain fluid. But just as this happens, Candy and Daniel are interrupted by the screeching halt of a car in front of Candy's crumbling house, right? So uh, Ligotti interrupts this interesting bit with the plot kind of crashing in on these characters and and daniel tugs the jar from candy's hands and wanders off to the the back of the house and he keeps watch on the living room he senses implicitly that something is dangerous here and he wants to uh, make sure that he can help in some way and it turns out that the car belongs to a police detective a, a white man and he's looking for daniel though he doesn't actually use daniel's name he just calls him the white kid and Candy knows who this police detective is, and, and she says as much, this cop is the pervert who took Candy's son and also the other kids in the neighborhood. He's the child murderer. But the cop doesn't care that Candy knows who he is. He just says, shut up, fat lady. I'm here for the white kid. And when Daniel reveals himself here, right, he intervenes in this situation. When he reveals himself, the cop explains that, well, you know, he's here to take him home, right? Right. But Daniel knows that this isn't true, that he knows that if he goes with this man, he's never going to go home again. And so Daniel takes action. He just immediately jumps into action. He tosses the jar of haunted brain fluid at the cop who catches it and then flashes a smile as this brain fluid affects him. It's a very different response to what Daniel and Candy have, but it's a response nonetheless. And this is a very creepy detail that Ligotti does in just one sentence that is easy to overlook. But the cop lets the jar go, and then he grabs Daniel, and Daniel stabs him with the fountain pen device that his father gave him. It comes back, as we knew it would. And the result of this is that the man crumbles to the ground dead, presumably from some kind of poison or something that he's been injected with. And, and now these dudes who are hanging around the living room that I, I mentioned earlier, these dudes come out of the shadows, and they undress the cop. And they're impressed by his almost new underwear, which they want for themselves. And stripping the body reveals the cop's genitals. And Daniel has a very weird response to this that I want to read. And, and it's going to come back when we get to the very end in just a, a few minutes. So Daniel says, we all saw what was there. No doubt about that. But I wondered if the others were as confused by it as I was. I had always thought about such things in an ideal sense, a, a mythic conception handed down over the centuries. But it was nothing like that. But we don't get any time to actually dwell on what Daniel says here because Candy begins yelling, put him in the hole. And the dudes do that. They, they drag the cop, this, this child murderer, they drag him to the toilet hole. They drop him into the disgusting muck. And then Candy has the dudes get rid of the car and then make themselves scarce. And Candy also has to get out of here now that they've killed a cop. And Daniel's worried about this. But Candy just says, there are plenty of places like this one in the city. No heat. No electricity, no plumbing, and no rent. I'll be all right. And then they say goodbye to each other. And that's really the end of this episode, though we are going to get the conclusion to the matter of the, the young man in the basement laboratory in just a moment. I do want to point out one thing here, which is going to come into play in our discussion, which is that they also rob 
the man, uh, not just of his clothing, but also of his money. They steal his money. And they also use the word business to describe anybody coming up to the house. So it's it's almost as if this is not a unique occurrence necessarily. Maybe it's unique that the policeman is here, but this indicates that Candy and the other people in the house are really engaged in a criminal enterprise that goes beyond squatting. Though what that is besides dipping hot dogs into mayonnaise is really really unclear to me. They don't seem to be dealing drugs. Maybe they're on drugs, but they could also just be kind of washed out. But the the constant reference to the visitors as business is really questionable. And the way in which everybody is just okay with throwing these bodies in the this body in the hole makes it feel like this is something that they do. They move from house to house, just like Daniel's family does. So I just want to keep those in mind because we're going to talk about what, if anything, some of these parallels mean in the discussion. Right. The way Ligotti describes all of this is very much the way that someone might describe a a kind of small-time drug-dealing enterprise, right? People pull up to this house, they go inside, they get you know a little bag of whatever it is. Candy is there as she has some connection to a bigger supplier, but then she's got these dudes that hang around in the shadows as kind of the muscle, right? Except that we don't actually see anything like that happening. We don't see any actual drug dealing. And given that everything else that is happening in this story is actually weird in the weird fiction sense it's also easy to think that candy might be some kind of like wizard or something like that who's doing like occult stuff right that there's a, a slice of occult detective fiction here or urban fantasiness about what the, the about the nature of their actual business right they might i don't know have some connection to fairy or something like that none of that shows up in the story but i i think that it's not the mundane business of dealing drugs here Well, when Daniel gets home from Candy's, he finds that his mother and sister have also returned from their most recent trip. But at the moment, he's actually much more interested about the dude in the the basement. And when he gets downstairs, the place is a mess. It just looks like someone has taken an axe to his father's equipment. And Ligotti writes here, Wires and cords hung from the ceiling, all of them chopped through and dangling like vines in a jungle. A greasy, greenish liquid was running across the floor and sluicing into the basement drain. And there are also pages from his father's notebooks that are strewn all over the place, and they've got exclamations scrawled all over them, uh, exclamations, and they're, all, they're in all caps, and some of these are, nothing but impurities, impure heads, and the forces of an impure universe. So, not particularly sane. But what's most distressing here, actually, is that there is a massive chair connected to all sorts of wires, and on that chair is the young man from Citizens for Faith, And he is the source of the the greenish liquid that has gotten everywhere, right? It's his brain siphonage. And the young man is in bad shape. And Daniel, in fact, can't even tell if he's still alive in any conventional sense of the word. And then he says that, in any case, his condition was such that my family would once again need to find another house in which to live. As if this happens all the time. There's a real uh, mundane, kind of banal response to this. And Daniel's sister even pops down to the basement here as well and just kind of shrugs and more or less says, oh, again. And she's mostly actually just interested in whether they'll be able to get any money from the guy since she and their mother have come back from their trip broke. And we get the real sense here that the purpose of their trip was to make money, was to come back with some kind of profit from doing something, though what that something is is not clear. And, And Daniel even asks her about the adventure that they've been on, but she won't say anything about it other than to ask Daniel if he knows what a hermaphrodite is. And this question sends Daniel's mind spinning because of that is what had so unsettled him about this child murdering cop. And and this can't be a coincidence. And Daniel assumes that his mother and sister have had some interaction then with this cop, right? Because otherwise, what are the odds, right? And he asks if their mother mentioned him, mentioned his name to this cop. And what he's really asking here is how this cop knew to look for him at Candy's. And his sister just says, how's this thing between you and mom going to end? Every time I mention her name, she just clams up. It doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't make any sense, right? We don't get an explanation for this. And uh, the two of them, the siblings, just go back upstairs where mom and dad are hanging out. And Daniel asks his father to clarify something. He knows that two of the three principles that have to be eradicated are uh, belief in nations and belief in gods. But he doesn't know what the third one is. A father doesn't answer, but mother does. And she does it with a smile. She says, why... It's family, sweetheart. And that's the last line of the story. And it leaves us with the understanding, I think, that Daniel's mother had more or less sold him to this child-murdering hermaphrodite cop. 
Yeah, the end of the story really raises more questions than it answers. One one thing I want to say is that Daniel's rationalization for why his mother is able to answer what this third obstacle is, is that she must have been exposed to his father's rantings about this stuff more than anybody else in the family. But it's not clear to me that that's the case. And it, that also raises a lot of questions about what the mother's role in these experiments really is. You know, we get the sense now that there's a real strange relationship, maybe one of mutual disdain between Daniel and his mother, but that doesn't play out in the language. The mother again says like, Hey baby, like she's just, she's almost loving in her chatting with him. And the end of the story also raises a problem that this family, just by nature of being a family or calling themselves a family is victim to one of the obstacles of pure conception, which might lead to the father's madness, but the father's sort of madness or, or catatonia at the end of the story here and all of the fluid downstairs and the dead man could indicate that maybe the father tried to experiment on himself as well. There's an enormous amount left open at the end of the story. So we have a lot to unpack in our discussion. I think maybe the best way to begin to unpack what is going on in the story, uh, though I think we probably covered a lot in our, in our recap is to look at some of the parallels or at least compare and contrast the two primary locations in the story, which are, Candy's house and Daniel's house. And Daniel is the one who goes between them. We learned that both have this haunted sense to them. One is through Daniel's sense that the attic is haunted and this gets siphoned away from him. And the other is through dis- Ligotti's descriptive language of these houses, which is really uh, meant to evoke a haunted house setting that Candy lives in, not to mention the TV without the power cord and Daniel's rationalizations and there's so much strangeness that surrounds candy. Uh, both houses contain people engaged in illicit activities who never leave the house. And this is a comparison between candy and Daniel's father. We never see Daniel's father leaving the house. Both have basements with grim secrets, uh, really, really grim secrets. And it's also my sense that both candy and Daniel's family are squatting, even though Daniel is convinced due to his father's philosophy that they are living uh, by paying rent for everything. However, we get that line from candy when she's talking about the next place she's going to live. And that includes no rent as part of the place. So her philosophy is no renting. Yes. She still has a TV and a couch and some of the, and the couch is important here because it's also a commonality uh, for Daniel's dad's philosophy, the impressions of the couch. So it's a weird sort of symbolic overlap there. So it may be the case that Daniel's family is renting everything, but I think they also squat if they have to move around like this and leave dead bodies in basements. It's really hard to get your security deposit back (laughs) when you are murdering people and leaving a brain juice sluicing all over the floor. Uh, You're not going to get that 250 bucks back or whatever it was. Right. We found that out the hard way in Colorado. (laughs) Right. Uh, But I don't know, Glenn, can you think of any other parallels, uh, relevant parallels or, or comparisons or contrasts between these two places? And what do you think Ligotti is doing by setting up these parallels? Well, as you've already pointed out, there are disgusting sort of uh, habits that are going on in the house as well, right? There's the the European cigarettes in Daniel's house and then the jar of mayonnaise in Candy's house. And you've you've pointed out how Daniel has different responses to these things, but they are parallel th- aspects of what's going on in the house. And And the other thing to say, I guess, is that there is an adventure happening in each of these houses in this story, both of which are prompted by the inciting incident of just a stranger happening by these houses, right? It's the the kid from Citizens for Faith ringing the doorbell at Daniel's house, but then it's Daniel just kind of hesitating in front of Candy's house long enough for Candy to say, hey, kid, come here, right? And and so even the, the two adventures then in the two houses have a sort of parallel structure to them. Yeah, I I also want to point out that I think, you know, the environments are both objectively disgusting. They violate a sense of what we might consider purity in terms of like cleanliness or or cleansing or something like that. But Daniel is really free from any notion that would cause him to feel disgust or even caution when he's entering any of these spaces. He's a very, very disturbed child. And we get that through his real lack of reaction to encountering these dead bodies in the bathroom without a bathroom and all, all of these sort of strange events that he encounters. He's more excited by them. And 
you know, we know that he has been experimented on explicitly. So do you think that one thing Ligotti is pointing out is through Daniel's encounter with these sort of parallel environments and his neutral or maybe disaffected or nonchalant reaction to a lot of the horrible stuff that's going on, with the exception of his mother's European cigarettes, that Daniel's state of mind and his easy acceptance of these things represent on some level what his father's trying to accomplish with regards to purity, that this is a way of telling the story without telling the story by backgrounding the main theme, the title of the story. I really wondered about this too. I really wondered about Daniel's response to, to life in these, these two bad neighborhoods, the bad neighborhood and the, the worst neighborhood. And I definitely played around with the idea that Daniel's father had already been experimenting on Daniel a lot and has just kind of taken something of his essence, something of his brain or his, his soul perhaps away from him and numbed him, make, made him sort of a, a less complete person, right? He's robbed him of, of, of some part of his, his, his spark. And that is definitely possible. But I actually started to really think on my, my second and third reading that, that this is really more about the environment that Daniel is growing up in, right? It, it, we, we get this extremely vivid description of the worst neighborhood, of Candy's neighborhood, but less so of the bad neighborhood. But part of that description of the worst neighborhood does indicate to us that the bad neighborhood that Daniel lives in, which is the type of neighborhood they normally live in, has boarded up doors and windows, right? So it's not just a a, a neighborhood for poor people. It's not just a neighborhood with cheap rent. And I do think you're right that they're squatting. They're squatting, but the difference is they're squatting in a house that has boards over the windows instead of just nothing over the windows. But it's still not a place that any of us would want to be raising children. And it's almost inconceivable what growing up in an environment like that would do to children, right? I think it's perfectly possible that there might not even be working plumbing in the house that they're in either, such that Daniel is kind of less shocked by this uh, experience in the slightly worse neighborhood, where the hole in the floor is the thing that's different, not that there's no functioning bathroom. It's that it's broken in addition to being non-functioning. None of that is really clear in the in the text, though. So it could also there could also be this supernatural uh, or, or you know, weird fiction explanation for it as well. Right. I, I mean, I think that's an excellent point, the way these, these parallels kind of point out uh, the condition that Daniel is living in without him needing to say, this is how I live every day. He says, well, this is worse than how I live, and uh, I live in a slightly better condition, so it's not that bad. Uh, I absolutely think that's a, a brilliant explanation of some of the way that Ligotti is using these parallels to cover Daniel's own trauma in his environment. I also wonder if the state we see the men in in the house and the state that Candy is in with her simple expression that her child is dead and been murdered, that if these people also aren't victims of the father's experimentation in some way, if, if this explanation of the child murderer, if the descriptions of the people around Candy that are just like washed out and slack the same way we find the father when Daniel gets home, if that's a not another indicator that the father goes in to these worse adjacent neighborhoods to collect specimens and test on people who have experienced trauma in some way. Um, so that's another question I have going on. Where does the father get his material, his people to experiment on. And I wonder if there isn't some sort of recognition between Daniel and Candy that is the recognition of both of them having lost this sense of longing for somebody that has died in some way. For Daniel, it's like a weird, like there's a ghost in the attic. For her, she never lost the sense that her son was still with her, but it she was no longer feeling it or experiencing it in the same way that Daniel didn't experience the haunting after his father did the, the test, the experiment. Yeah. As you said, there are maybe more questions than answers to this story because a lot of, a lot of how this story works is on uh, sense or, or mood, right? Ligotti is evoking a kind of mood here and not spelling out a lot of things. And so I have real questions about this police detective who. I guess is the one who's murdering the kids, right? Or at least that's what Candy believes. But 
this guy also has some connection with Daniel's family. At least that's what we're given to understand, led to understand at the end of the story. And so is the cop actually murdering children or is he getting children for Daniel's father, who is the reason they've gone missing? But if that's the case, why is this cop then a hermaphrodite? What's the significance of, of that? And then also, how would the logistics of this actually work? Why would this cop be doing this? Why would he be getting children for this local mad scientist, right? What's what's in it for him? And then what is he actually doing at the house in this adventure? Why Why has he gone after Daniel? Yeah, I think we're going to have to push the hermaphrodite question to the forum because I don't have a good explanation for that other than it is maybe uh, a, an odd way to represent an impurity in biology, though I, I'm not quite sure what to do with that with this story. I don't think that the cop is getting children to experiment, w- w- to to give to Daniel's father for experimentation. I think he is just uh, maybe selling them or something like that. Um, and the reason why I think that is because Daniel's father gives gives both of his kids this this weapon and says, do not even tell your mother about this. And so I think that indicates that there's some fear that Daniel Daniel's father has towards his mother. And, and I have a few questions about that in just a minute. Yeah, that's a great point. The, the connection, if there is one, seems to be between the mother and the, the cop and the father maybe knows about it and is actually concerned about it. And that's another contrast that we have here is the two mother figures in this story, Candy and then Daniel's mother. Candy is haunted by the loss of her child, the loss of her son, right? But Daniel's mother is ready and perhaps even has actually tried to get rid of her son and to profit by it in in some way, right? So there's just another contrast here between Daniel's home and Candy's home. Well, I think this conversation is leading us to talk about the father's experiments uh, more specifically, and we'll we'll be returning to this topic of what is going on with the family. Um, But I have another question I want to hit first, which is the broad category of the experiments are designed to take away the impurities or the obstacles of pure conception, which are nations, beliefs of national identity, uh, religious or superstitious convictions or beliefs, and families. And so why do you think that these ideas are impurities for Daniel's father, that they, that they remove the ability to have a pure conception of the world? Do you think it's because there are ideas that we inherit rather than we can kind of come to on our own. But I'm not even sure that such a thing is possible. It seems like Daniel's father has just a really bad grasp on philosophy and the meaning of social norms and conventions and why we have them to begin with. <laughs> right. Uh, among the many things that uh, that Daniel's father could do to kind of rehabilitate himself would be to take a couple philosophy classes at the local community college. But I, but I had the same question too, because the idea of of nations and it gets shorthanded to nations near the end of the story but when we encounter that at the beginning it's not nations in the sense of ethnic groupings or nationalities he's he's really talking about states right and and this is what citizens for right he's talking about the idea that that there are governments and that we can be citizens of them there are, there, are, there are countries or states that we can be citizens of not that we can have like ethnic identities or linguistic identities and so on And then also we have families, right? And the things that state and family both have in common is that they are memberships in a, in a group, right? But, and and we could say that about religion as well, right? A religion tends to be a group of people who are engaged in an activity together, but that's not the part of religion that Daniel's father ever actually talks about. He's talking about superstitious belief. So to me, that almost seems like an outlier from the other two. So I had some trouble making sense of this list and what they have in common, like why it's these three things and not four or five other things, other sorts of things that people believe in or types of behavior, types of group associations that they have, right? He's not railing against bowling leagues, right? Right, exactly. Though I think he would if that was the primary group identifier, (laughs) the way people committed, like the way people expressed loyalty to one another. I think part of it is that they are all groups, as you said, that people people are members of, at least two of them 
the membership requires no initiation. As a citizen, you're born as a citizen wherever you live. Family, you're born into a family. And this could maybe also be the case with local religions uh, until you change your mind or, or something happens. But you, many people uh, follow their local religion their whole life. I sort of read this as an element of the weird that Ligotti is playing with as taking the sort of dark romanticism, the the nature of Gothic literature um, and taking that, that element of romanticism uh, that is the celebration of the individual to the extreme extreme and exploring again, some of these Gothic themes, which I have, you know, we'll, we'll talk about in a few more minutes, but that's the only way I can make sense of it is that this story is primarily and first and foremost a subversion of the gothic tale i agree with that wholeheartedly right that the the father is promoting this kind of rugged individualism as not rugged in the marlboro sense but maybe uh aggressive, antagonistic individualism, that it's not just about asserting your individualness within the context of the various groups that you're also a member of, but it's actually about actively destroying those types of group identities, not even just specific group identities, but the actual whole category, getting rid of the whole idea that you can be a citizen of a country or an adherent of a religion or a member of a family to eradicate families altogether, at least in a, in a, conceptual sense biologically they're not actually going to go away though maybe that's something with the hermaphrodite imagery here in the story as well and so and so this is something the father has really dialed up all the way to i don't know probably not even 11 but to like 14 or something maybe 13 that's a bad number we'll pick we'll say 13 right (laughs) right and because he's killing people for for this notion right so it it is this kind of uh you know william blake uh, romantic idea but taken to a, an utter extreme right which is you know frankenstein this is the the promethean or the frankenstein or the promethean man this extreme level of individualism that breaks every category of loyalty and identity that we have so you are literally alone and I have to wonder if one of the struggles with the father is that he's not had the courage to do these experiments on himself, but he has tried to remove these elements from people in his family. So he is stuck with these identities, with these beliefs and conceptions that make him think the universe is impure while his family, while he witnesses his family who has slaked off some of these beliefs as the result of his experiment. And this is maybe part of his madness. We have Daniel hating the European cigarettes as a main theme of this story, which could be connected to not just the siphoning of the haunting belief that Daniel has, he's haunting the attic with his mind, but that the father also took a little bit away to make him think that National identities are impure, and that's why he feels defiled by his mother smoking and by little of anything else. Daniel's mother has no real sense of family. She almost relishes this notion that family is the third category, and it's the one the father can't say. The mother's also kind of a weird, sadistic type of character and doesn't seem to mind bringing her daughter along with her on errands that involve the maybe kidnapping and slavery or murder of her own son. And his sister has no loyalty to her bro- to Daniel either because she won't tell him anything that's going on. It's you and dad and it's me and mom, but like it's convenient. It's a, it's a relationship of convenience and of mutual benefit, not of family loyalty or love even. And his sister has no real sense of the meaning of death. When they encounter the man in the suit in the basement, her only question is about money, which could be, which could represent the removal of a sense of the sacredness of human life, which is a core part of almost every religion. So I, you know, I'm just thinking through what is happening in this family. And it seems to me there could be evidence in the story and the story could be read in a way that the father has removed some of these impurities from his family, but it has not improved his life in the way that he expected. Well, I think that's true. And I think we see that the father has maybe not done these experiments on himself because he clearly still is concerned about his children, but the mother is not. And she actually seems like she might be pure that he's removed all of it 
from her. And that's why she does. And that's why she doesn't at all care about, about Daniel, that he's someone that she can actually victimize. She can sell him uh, for, for money, at least if, if, if my understanding of what's going on is correct. And you mentioned also the kind of idea that it's, it's dad and Daniel and then mom and, and, and daughter kind of as, as two separate teams in this family that we actually have two different weird fiction archetypes in this family and the parents of this family of the mad scientist. And I, I think we can see mom in a kind of serial killer uh, capacity, a serial killer archetype, or maybe, you know, serial abductor type of archetype here. And they also maybe seem to be kind of training their kids, right? And this is why uh, Daniel's sister is going out on these unknown sabbaticals with mom, is that she's actually kind of being trained. And maybe the reason they know about the the child murdering cop is because I don't know, they've been at some kind of like serial killer or kidnapper convention or something like that, which is a little bit on my mind because of uh, Brent and I are at that point in the Sandman, right? (laughs) And uh, and in fact, uh, frankly, I mean, this this character, the cop character in this story, I really was kind of envisioning even the Corinthian from the Sandman, uh, just the kind of juxtaposition of my readings this week. And so I think you're right that that we are seeing that Daniel's father has succeeded in some way, but it has not worked. It has actually not made the world a better place to remove the idea of of nations and religion and families from his own family members. Right. And if we're reading the story in such a way that the parallel elements cover are a cover for untold parts of the story, the way we see... Daniel's father used Daniel as a lure for the man in the suit to say, it's okay. I have a son. He lives here. Everything's fine. That could indicate the parallel of the mother daughter relationship that the daughter, that the mother uses the daughter in order to attract men to rob or however they do it. And it's just, it's so unsavory and so unsettling and Ligotti's technique of hinting at things and then walking it back leaves you with this sense of real impurity in anything that's going on in this family. Oh, yeah. I mean, th- that's a great notion because now I can even envision what actually has happened in the background, right? How how has the cop found Daniel and why is that uh, be- that he actually walked into this sort of honey trap type of situation where they're hoping to rob him, but actually he gets the better of them. He gets the upper hand and the mom intervenes and says, no, you can't actually kill my daughter because I need her for my own business. But Hey, you can go have my son who I don't need. I'll let you know where you can find him because he wanders into this neighborhood where you already operate and no one will miss him. And we'll just never report him to the police because we've got our own bodies in basements. Something like that maybe has has gone on here, though. You know, we'll never know for sure. Yeah, it's very unsettling. Uh, there's just a few more things I want to bring up here. Maybe just two more questions. We've we've already talked the, about the father, sort of the romantic figure and the gothic figure, but I want to take the, another gothic element of this story uh, before we kind of summarize what we think about Ligotti is doing with the gothic tropes. But that is the senses of the hauntings in this story, the language of this burnt out neighborhood that is all classic haunted house language, glowing curtains and shifting in shadows and all this uh, sort of stuff. And Daniel's own feeling that uh, a soul has been left behind. Are there ghosts in this story in your mind? Is candy a ghost? Is Daniel? I know early in our recap, I said, Daniel's definitely not a ghost, but I'm not convinced that candy isn't some kind of apparition or, or spirit in some way. Yeah, there's an odd feature of this story, which is that you know we're told that Daniel, prior to the, the start of this story, has had some of his brain fluid siphoned off, and that this has led him to no longer have this sense of the hanged man, the, the suicide in the attic. But yet, the description that we get of the transition from his neighborhood to Candy's neighborhood invokes this idea that the the moon that he sees when he's in Candy's neighborhood is not the same moon that he sees when he's in his own neighborhood or in other parts of the world, right? There's a real sense that he has actually wandered into a fairy. This is, a, of course, a romantic idea with you know a big R uh, or a gothic idea, right? It's a definitely sort of 19th century artistic literary movement idea here uh, that Ligotti is, is using to hammer home some of these images. But this is an idea that I think you would lose if you've had this siphoned from you. It is possible he's having this 
idea only while he's holding the jar or something like that. So there are some workarounds there. But all of this is really just to say that Ligotti describes Candy's house in the neighborhood as if it is another world. And so maybe it is, right? These dudes in the, the shadows who are interested in the cops you know, almost do underwear and take his money. I mean, they might just be Candy's drug dealing employees or something like that if this is really mundane. But they appear as almost unhuman figures who just lurk in the shadows, who kind of are themselves creatures of the shadows, who come out of the the shadows as if they might even be coming from an, another realm, coming from some kind of fairy realm, crossing over, something like that. None of that's explicit and none of it matters to the plot of the story, but that is the mood of this world. And I don't know if that's just mood, just the technique that Ligotti is using to sort of make this strange, to make us think about something that is actually mundane as if it is the weird, as if it is fantastical, or if it is actually fantastical. I'm not sure about that. Right. The men could be wraiths and Candy could be a ghost and the glow from the TV isn't real. And Daniel's whole experience of this is maybe the result of the fact that he has this sense of the supernatural, of the ghost world, of a fairy or something like that, drained away from him, but still wanders into it and is now trying to rationalize what's going on. He recognizes the imagery of the change, but can't experience the profound profound supernatural nature of it. And that could be another element, another layer to the story, uh, or it could just be mood, as you said. <laughs> yeah, th- I think we're just going to have to kick this one to the forum as well. In fact, I-, I expect a lot of forum chatter about this story because it was so awesome. And because all of it is a question, none of, his- none of it is answered. It's an amazing story, and I'm looking forward to talking about it. Yeah, me too. Well, let's just get to our last question here, which we've been talking about a lot throughout both the recap and the discussion. But I think it's just helpful to categorize this story as a gothic tale, primarily. So... I'm wondering if if we look at the story in that way, if Ligotti is questioning the possibility of whether or not we can even tell gothic stories now in our contemporary age. So, Glenn, in, in what ways for you does this story both reinforce and subvert tropes of the gothic genre? Well, right off the bat, the story has two real serious gothic tropes, right? We've got these decrepit collapsing buildings, which is a real trope of, of gothic fiction, right? These old buildings that are uh, collapsing, that, the, the, that are emblematic of a world itself that has fallen into ruin. I'll come back to that in a second. The other element that we have immediately is dysfunctional families, families that are themselves in ruin in some state. And we have two families there. One where the family has clearly done this to itself and and another that's been victimized, right? Candy's family. She's lost her child. Candy is an extraordinarily sympathetic person. And it's real easy to see that she perhaps was once a functional person who didn't just eat mayonnaise uh, dipped in hot dogs out of a, out of a jar and salami sticks, I guess, and squat in houses, but may have had a traditional job and uh, a a functioning home somewhere, but she lost her son. Her son was, was killed and she's been ruined by that. She's haunted by that. So the dysfunctional families, but so often in Gothic stories, the, the world itself falling into ruin is actually often about uh, changing economies. And this can be, you know, if we're, we're thinking about uh, about England, this has to do with the, this industrialization and the way that that's affecting uh, the way that that's affecting aristocrats who used to make a lot of money off of an agrarian economy, but now in an industrial world, uh, if they haven't been able to switch over to invest their capital into that industrial world, suddenly aren't rich anymore, even though they've got them, these massive estates and own this land. In fact, owning the massive estates, owning the land is actually costing them. It's hurting them. We see this with the, the colonial economies as well. I mean, that's a, a big part of Jane Eyre, for example, is the connection with the colonial economies. But we can definitely see that here in this story, though it's never rendered explicit, but that this is taking place in an urban environment, an American city. American cities in the second half of the 20th century crumbled because of a massively changing economy as the the steel industry collapsed and had cascading effects. And 
people who weren't able to switch to doing something else, switch from uh, from a manufacturing job to some kind of service job successfully have been uh, victimized by that. And we could describe a lot of uh, American cities or, or parts of American cities. I mean, and I'm thinking specifically of parts of Philadelphia, very near to where we are recording this, that have this gothic sense about them because of this rapidly changing economy that left the city just blighted in this way. So these are some of the, the gothic elements I think that I see Ligotti working with here where he's saying, hey, look, this is this has happened in the in 20th century America as well. This isn't just a 19th century British phenomenon. I think Ligotti is also exploring the motivations for malice that come out of these changing economies that drive these aristocrats to, you know, either think about their dead ancestors and how they've let let them down or be obsessed with heritability and uh, performing mad experiments or something like that <laughs> you know which which is kind of how gothic tales morph into into weird fiction but he's looking at the way that th- these people have taken some some values and traditions from society and turned them into real vices into motivations that are purely malicious. You see this in Gothic stories with an obsession with pure bloodlines, for instance, with cousins marrying each other, brothers and sisters marrying each other, obsessed with that level of purity. But in this story, the the blame is sort of the global economy, the the sense that if there is such a thing as a global economy that destroyed our inner cities and took away manufacturing jobs, then the idea of nations is is insane. And if nations, why not families and why not religions? And this father turning these, the father turning these sort of traditional values and social norms into a vice, almost echoing the genocides of the 20th century, obsessed with racial purity or other sorts of things that are going on and looking at what motivates that and how somebody turns from a maybe productive member in society into a mad scientist, which I think we could classify a lot of the 20th century dictators and tyrants on some level as mad scientists. Well, I think that's a a great catch, right? That there is something here about the kind of technologization, I'm just making that word up, of of society, where really, you know, when it comes down to it, what the father is trying to do here is to get rid of emotional attachments out of people and to just to to, to because those are impurities and to make us hyper rational people. He's I guess trying to make Vulcans, right? In 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 some sense here, by saying if if we get rid of our emotional motivations for things and if we only are motivated by rational choice. We don't have superstitious beliefs in nonsense anymore. Then the world will be a better place. But that is the the project of the 20th century as well that led to things like eugenics, right? That we should get rid of impurities. That uh, that we that of course all of society would benefit if we get rid of types of people who are impure, who are less than. So let's let's just exterminate them, and then the world will be a better place. None of us believe that about the world. We know that that's a monstrosity, that that is horror, right? And Ligotti has has done that here with the, the father character. And I think that we're seeing that play out just in this, you know, the, it, that what played out on a kind of global stage in the actual 20th century is happening here just in a microcosm, in the microcosm of this family. That's an awesome catch. Right. And Ligotti softens the blow by saying, well, it's just an element of your soul that we'll take out or an element of your consciousness that we can remove harmlessly. We don't have to kill the person. But it, it raises all of these questions about, well, don't these things make up who people are? And is it really easy to just say that all people are are their memes, their inherited knowledge and their cultural knowledge or their beliefs uh, to really... I think I think Ligotti's done a lot with this story, and it really flies under the radar. And it's a real testament to his skill that he's able to pull off as much as he has in 15 pages. Yes, this is an absolutely brilliant story. I loved it. I think this is probably one of my favorites that we've done so far. A little bit of foreshadowing to our upcoming uh, year in review episode. Still got a few weeks before we get there. But I think that since we are starting to look ahead, I think that's going to do it for this episode. I'm Glenn McDorman. And I'm Brandon Buddha. You can find us in our other creative projects at claytemplemedia.com. 
If you'd like to vote in our story selection polls, please join us, as we said at the top of the episode, on Patreon. Patreon support keeps the network going, and we're getting really close to some exciting stretch goals right now. Yeah, I can't wait to reach those. And please, while you're on the internet, head on over to the Clay Temple forums and let us know what you thought of this story. I think we got to the end here, uh, towards the end here, we got to a, a reading of this that's uh, really rooted in 20th century history and literary tropes. But I think there are some uh, some other readings that could be drawn out of this story. We also still have a lot of unanswered questions that we uh, we kind of kicked to you guys in the middle of the, the discussion here. We'd love to hear your thoughts about that as well. Yeah, please join us on the forum. Next time, we'll be back with The Door to Saturn by Clark Ashton Smith. Until then, we greet you and say farewell. Farewell.